Hello and welcome to Sharon Local History. In this video I would like to uh, tell you about Rattlesnake Hill. Rattlesnake Hill is one of the highest peaks in the area and Sharon Friends of Conservation organized amazing hike in collaboration with Sharon Historical Society. So we had a uh, close to three hour hike actually and we managed to squeeze in lots of geology as well as history. There are short clips, short videos that um, you will be able to listen to more information about the Rattlesnake Hill and the area and um, I hope you will enjoy it. It's a great place to hike. So first we met at the Mountain Street and Erika gave us a little introduction. i here a long time. I work currently um, at a company where I do contaminant site remediation and mm -hmm. also water supply work. So I can answer questions if you guys have things about questions about those. But um, I'm mostly here to tell you a little bit about sort of the general geologic picture of this area and then answer questions as we go. This is a really big group. Um, I can be quite loud, but I understand that it still can be a little bit difficult to hear sometimes. So as we walk, if you have questions or there's something you didn't hear, we can always talk about something twice. That's totally fine. Um, most of the really good stuff is at the top. So that's where we're headed, but there are some tidbits along the way that I do want to share. What I'll start us off with is just to orient ourselves. What we're standing on right now is glacial sediment. So the most recent thing that happened in New England is everything was covered with glacial ice up to a mile of it in some places, if you can imagine. Um, there's been some work done to try and figure out just how much ice and most of the major peaks in New Hampshire and Vermont were submerged under ice during the last glaciation. So there were maybe only one or two spots that were peeking out the top of the ice like little tiny rock islands. So you can imagine standing next to something 4,000 feet high and there was ice all the way to the top. That's what it was like here about 14,000 years ago. So not so great for people, um, great for ice. So <laughs> as the ice recedes, it leaves behind all kinds of deposits, mostly sand and gravel. And that's what we're standing on right now is sand and gravel. As we walk up towards the top of Rattlesnake Hill, there's another kind of glacial material called till. Till is a lot stiffer, it has more clay in it, and it gets stuck onto the side of bedrock. So like what we're gonna walk up today, often they're plastered with this material called till. So we're gonna go from sandy gravel up through the till, and then to the bedrock that's poking out the top of the till. And that's a really common pattern of the bedrock hill has tail around it like a wreath and then below that as you get into lower elevations is the sand and gravel and we can talk when we get to the top a little bit more about how that forms and how that happens but just wanted to give you a feel for what we're going to walk through did the the boulders yep with, did they get deposited with the till different stages of what it was. There's different stages of ice deposition and usually boulders are dropped as the glacier is leaving. Oh, okay. So they, they're picked up in the ice or they're sitting on top of the ice and as the ice melts back those get left behind. I will throw in some basic information about the area. So the summit of Rattlesnake Hill is one of the highest points between Boston and Providence. In winter one can see all around Sharon and to Boston. The summit is shaped like a recliner with a gentle north slope and steep south slope. It is formed of granite with unusual rocks and features and markings, which we'll see later. In the past, there have been timber rattlesnakes, and that's why they named it Rattlesnake Hill. Again, we will mention it later. So from the mountain street, we continue on the trail towards the summit. It is easy to find. It's not well marked, but the path is quite visible, as you can see here. And we stopped a few times and we were uh, reading, sharing different information. So here's Paul Lahnstein. Go. <laughs> okay, you can go now. On November 5th, 2019, Sharon Town Meeting voted to use Community Preservation Act funds and a grant from the state to purchase and preserve most of this 337 acre parcel of natural open space, which has been classified as priority habitat by the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, NHESP. Rattlesnake Hills Granite Dome rises to an elevation of 431 feet, affording views of Boston and Cape Cod. 
Parallel scrape marks in the bare granite at the summit are evidence that glaciers up to a mile thick advanced and retreated over Massachusetts during the last ice age. Rattlesnake Hill adjoins Borderland State Park. Together they comprise an area of almost 2,200 acres of contiguous natural open space. Vernal pools at Rattlesnake Hill support a diverse ecosystem including rare Blanding's turtles that migrate seasonally from the ponds at Borderland State Park to feed on amphibian legs, eggs in spring and then return to Borderland when the vernal pools dry up. The rocky terrain is ideal habitat for timber, timber rattlesnakes, but no sightings have been reported in recent memory. Today, that's actually not true. I got a picture of one last year. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, so and this I, article's uh, older. Um, in here? Yeah. Today, the timber rattlesnake is one of the most endangered species in Massachusetts, having sustained the largest decline of any native reptile species in the past 150 years. Conservation commissioners, advocacy groups, and residents have been trying to preserve Rattlesnake Hill for more than 20 years. It had been slated first for a 624-unit senior living community and subsequently for a 250-unit 40B housing development. In the end, the developer elected to build only five houses along Mountain Street and sell the rest of the land to Sharon for preservation. Thank you. Thank you. So, by the way, it's a great experience to explore this 2.1 mile out and back trail in Sharon. Generally, it is considered quite easy route. Um, it is about 44 minutes to complete. It took us much longer. This trail is great for hiking, running, and it's unlikely you will meet, see anybody. It's pretty deserted. It's awesome. Okay. And that's part of how it grew. Well, so these rocks are part of what got stuck on to the side of North America. Well, I love going rock cutting upstate New York pots dam in places. Yep. Very interesting. A few years ago we had some really cold winters. Like 2015. Yeah. We had all that snow. So now I would like to share some information about Erika, the amazing geologist who led the hike and shared so much information. So Erika Amirlin is a licensed professional geologist with 20 years of experience in the earth sciences. She works as a hydrogeologist at AECOM in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, focusing on contaminated site cleanup. Previously, she worked assisting municipal clients in Massachusetts and New Hampshire in finding and, de finding and developing new sustainable drinking water sources. She has also worked for the U.S. Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California, as a seismic hazard educator and has done extensive volunteering with science outreach program in, programs in both Massachusetts and California. Erika is a water commissioner for the Acton Water District and also serves as president of the board of the wastewater treatment facility for the village of Nagog Woods. I will share her email on the end in case you and your group would like to have her um, to lead your hikes. She's more than happy to share any information she can, so please don't hesitate to contact her. Yeah. I think that's a Monel River. Mon English, please. Monel, M O N E L, is a material, a metal that's a, I don't know if it's an amalgamate, it's a mixture of metals. Mm -hmm. uh, so the material doesn't deform with temperature right. variations. Well, Monel. That looks like it was set as a benchmark for running yeah, elevation. <laughs> Over the year, there have been many fires at Rattlesnake Hill. They were common between the 30s to the mid 80s. Most occurred during dry summers. Many remember them as yearly occurrences in the 50s. The area was overgrown and the fires often started by lightning or by humans trying to feed kids. Unfortunately, there were no buildings in proximity that were no, no dollar loss. So the fires were not a priority. These fires were very time consuming and needed lots of manpower. Sharon DPW helped a lot to extinguish the fires. The National Guard was called to help as well. There were multi-day operations. Fire Captain John McLean, who grew up in Sharon, remembers a helicopter flying over the town collecting water from the lake and spreading it over the fires at Rattlesnake Hill. This was not a town-owned helicopter, but the National Guards who came to help. John's father, Stanley McLean, also a fireman, 
was there often to stop the fires. John remembers him spending days up there. John's mother told stories about how she and her mother made sandwiches for the men fighting the fire. The smoke was seen everywhere. There were stories <coughs> from golfers playing at the country club, smelling the smoke, even seeing the ashes. Sometimes it was too smoky to go outside at all. The fires are considered a natural current. Some trees need them to propagate. The chatter marks look like a little crescent. And there are chatter marks up here. Um, but there are chatter marks. Chatter marks are as the ice is passing over a rock, little pieces of rock that are stuck in the bottom of the glacier catch and gouge little pieces mm -hmm. out of this rock. This seems like a good time to share some topography. Uh, the surface of Sharon is diversified and uneven and increases in height, in height from the level of Trappol Brook on the northwest to an elevation of 302 feet above sea level at the post office square. Moose Hill, elevation 524, is on the western side of Massachusetts and it's the second highest point of land between the waters of Massachusetts and Narragansett Bays. Rattlesnake Hill, elevation 430, on the east, Cow Hill and Barefoot Hill on the south complete the highlands which almost ring the town. Nestled in between these hills is Lake Nassapok, a spring-fed lake covering approximately 400 acres which is Sharon's greatest natural asset. Geologically, Sharon is located in the area marked physically by glacial drumlings and caims and by the beds of the original streams that flow flowed from the glaciers that one time covered this part of the state. The land varies between two extremes, from rocky hilltops composed of Gloucester stony loam, which bedrock, at or near the surface, to the glacial stream beds in which course of centuries has built up substantial deposits of muck and peat often to a depth of many feet. Gloucester stony loam is composed of glacial drift derived mainly from granite and gneiss with stone fragments and boulders up to several feet in diameter scattered on the surface and through the soil. The glacial deposits in shallow with bedrock cropping out in numerous places. The bedrock is sienite, which is like granite except lacking the quartz component. The richness of the soil in the ancient stream beds attracted the early settlers who farmed the lands. So a little, now some juicy details about the actual rocks up here. So the rattlesnake granite is part of what's called a pluton. A pluton is a body of rock that cooled underground. Cools slowly, and that's why you can see the visible crystals here. Something like a volcanic rock, like basalt, like in Hawaii, cools really quickly at the surface, which is why it just looks like one color, just a mass of rock. This cooled over millions of years underground, and it cooled in stages. I think someone was mentioning to me about that earlier. Um, there's actually two different kinds of granite in the Rattlesnake Hill Pluton. There's one that's a little bit finer grained, which means the minerals are smaller, and a coarser grained one that has bigger minerals. And then on the edges, there's what's called a pegmatite. And pegmatites form at the end of cooling. So when most of this rock has formed and substantially cooled, there's some liquid left over, some water that's very thin, it flows easily, and it has a lot of elements left in it. And so it, on the edges, it makes these really big crystals, much bigger than in the main body. Um, mineral hunters love them. They're very impressive looking. And the reason they're so big is because it's mostly water. And so it's really easy in that liquid for minerals to grow and they can grow quickly and they can grow big. So I think someone had a piece of pegmatite, you did. Those come from the edges of the pluton. They, they cool last at the very end. Um, but all of this cooling, it takes millions of years for this granite to go from hot to cold. Um, and it is surrounded by another granite. So if you were to go outside the rattlesnake granite, there's the dedum granite. 
and there's a lot of datum granite. It's all over this area. And the datum granite was there first. It's about 609 million years old. And this granite came in and intruded. We call it intruding when hot rock comes into cold rock. This granite is about 370 million years old. So much, much, much younger. Um, and there are other granite bodies, other plutons going up Massachusetts into southern New Hampshire. Cape Ann is probably the most famous of them. Um, and there were two phases of formation. The ones down here, this one and the Peabody granite are in the late like 370s. And then the older ones up near Cape Ann are about 411 million years old. So we call that bimodal. There's two modes, two times of granite formation down here in the south and then another period up in the north part of Massachusetts. Is, is that a volcano? Is that what you're... It's saying? not. It's actually forming deep, deep, deep under the ground. Is it related to tectonic plate movements? It is. And what we're standing on right now, and that's such a good question, because this is a mini plate known as Avalonia. So mm -hmm. we're standing on what used to be its own mini continent. Yeah. Okay, and wow. how big? We don't know exactly. Big, like maybe the size of Japan. Yeah, and there were four mini continents. And New England is made up, at least in large part, of these four mini continents that smashed onto what was going to eventually become North America. So similarly to how there's a mainland and then the island of Japan is separated by a body of ocean, but it's actually on the move. There's lots of volcanoes. It's very tectonically active there. That's how these mini continents work. Very, very tectonically active and on the move towards the big continent, towards what would eventually become North America. So that's what let the magma come up, the, the cracks in the crust allowed the magma to come up like here? Actually, it doesn't even need cracks. Oh. It's hotter, so it wants to rise. So it actually pushes its way through the rock and will pull off pieces of the rock as it's going. And melt it. And melt it. Yep. Right. Yep. It's called intrusion. It comes up through the rock, and then usually, if it makes it all the way to the surface, it's a volcano. If it cools underground, it's a volcano. <coughs> and the thing that allows it to do that, are, is, I mean, the, the force that is promoting this intrusion has to do with the movement of these tectonic plates. That's what's yeah, making yeah. the rock melt. Yeah. 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 That's what's causing yeah, the like, melt. But there. what makes it rise is actually just that it's lighter. It's more buoyant. And so that hot rock wants to rise up. It doesn't want to just it's stay. Like it's flowing. It's yeah. flowing. Yeah. It's flowing up. Yeah. 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 And this all takes millions of years. It's happened very slowly. So it has time to push up and pull pieces of the rock into that body. It does sometimes find cracks, open them up, but it's not fast. It's not like water jetting out of the ground. Very, very, you know, way beyond anything we can really think about in terms of human lifetimes. Yeah. You said that um, Japan is made up of many plates and so forth. It's actually one plate. It's on or, its or own plate. plate. Yeah. Right, but we're made up, and it's got... Japan has active volcanoes and lots of earthquakes. We got multiple plates here, but we're like we almost never have earthquakes right. and no volcanoes. So why why perfect because it's not moving anymore. So when this was a plate, it was like that. So 370 million years ago, there were volcanoes, there were earthquakes. It was super active. But those eventually stop and it becomes dormant. It's no longer subject to the same processes when it's attached to the main continent. It's mm -hmm. literally like sutured on. Don't okay. so we have frequent tremors in New England? Would you call them earthquakes? They're, they're, they're like microquakes. Okay. Yeah. All, yeah. Measurable. All or measurable. Has we have them here. Yeah. yeah. You can feel suddenly your windows, your whole room will yeah. vibrate. Mm -hmm. We get a handful of them every year. Yeah. Yep. And that's normal because even though we're, it's pretty quiet here, the earth is always sort of breathing and moving. It's a, it's not a, nothing is static on the earth. Do you think it could come alive again? No. So is there any place in New England where it's easy to observe and see where there used to be volcanoes or is that all mostly been washed yes, away? Yes, the Blue Hills. Blue Hills? Yeah. That was one mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. What do we look for there? The rocks there are a different kind of rock. They're a, they're a volcanic rock. So they're much more 
like here you can see individual minerals. The minerals there are very small. They hmm. have a different texture, different kind of color. Um, but the blue hills are volcanic. We have never okay. noticed those of us who've been 10,000 times. Yeah. yeah. Take a little magnifying glass with you next time. Oh, Pick what's... up some rocks and look at them. Yeah. What's the extent of the rattlesnake granite? It's not very big. It's really not very big. And it's local to this it's area? It's just local to this area. Rattlesnake Hill is kind of approximately the center of it. It goes all the way down to the lake um, and then extends a few miles north, south, east. Mm. Hmm. So, so it includes the bluff on Moose Hill. The rocks there is quite, quite prominent. It would be within a mile of the lake. Probably that yeah. I don't know, but yes, and, and it includes borderlands also. Okay. And there's odd rocks, a uh, very large boulder in our yard, which my mother said was a rock spurring pudding stone. Yeah. Um, how did that get here? It was transported by the glacier. Ah. It's a very striking rock. It is. Yeah. Roxbury pudding stone is really special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really, really that. special. So, we brought yeah. samples. It's like glued rocks. together. Yeah. We live here. Yeah. Yeah. And Bush, so Bush. if Bush. anyone Bush. wants a sample yeah. of oh. the rocks, it has hematite in it. Wow. It has quartz. Yeah. It has gold. Feldspar. No gold. No gold. Um, we're parked like with the first group of people. If anyone wants one, when we leave, you're welcome. So I don't know if everybody heard Kathy. Kathy and her husband actually collects rocks. They live right here on uh, Rattlesnake Hill, and they are willing to give you some amazing. Uh, minerals with no gold, but amazing <laughs> minerals. I don't know if it's a futon, but where the rock is about, when it's wet, the color of your shirt, I mean, right at the camp, I, there's a name for it, I forgot, but it, when it's purple granite or something, yep. or just a few miles of it, but it's very distinctive, so it's not good. Do you remember what the name of that is? I don't, but it's related. All of those, all of those small granite bodies are related to each other. They all happen about the same time. Because sometimes here in Toton, you get random pieces that people have brought down. Down. But if yeah. you go like to the uh, what's the trustee's property at right near 128 there, Bradley is fit. Yeah, I actually worked there. Oh so that you know the purple yeah. lock. That, yeah, yeah. That's, I completely forget what yeah, that's called. That's Wait, do you think yeah. he's wearing purple shirt? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. there. <laughs> it's made are out there of rock. Certain type of uh, elements that are more natural in this area than than others. Yeah. So this kind of granite is. Um, a little bit of a technical term it's known as an alkali granite and granites part of what makes a granite a granite is it has quartz and it has feldspar those are like the two most common minerals and then there'll be other minerals these they, there's the two granites here have a black mineral called biotite and a black mineral called rebatite um, but the feldspar which is a majority part of any granite there's two kinds there's a, one that has a lot of sodium in it and one that has a lot of potassium and alkali granites have a lot of potassium feldspar in them. So this is, you, most of what's here is potassium feldspar. And then the pegmatites, which I was talking about on the edges of the pluton, have often have a lot of rare minerals, small concentrations of rare minerals. So things, you know, what we might call rare earth minerals like lithium, um, other things like that. Is arsenic prevalent? I, I know that there are certain areas in Massachusetts where arsenic is kind of prevalent yeah. in the soils and stuff. Does it come from the stone? Or it comes from the stone. Okay. Yep. Unfortunately, a lot of the granites, especially in northern New England, like Maine and New Hampshire, naturally have arsenic in them. Mm. And our groundwater here is a little bit acidic, naturally. And so it tends to leach minerals out of the rocks. So if you have arsenic in your granite and you have a well in granite, you might have elevated arsenic in your well. But it's naturally occurring. It's, right. you know. Where does the radon come from? Same thing. It comes from the radioactive minerals in the granite. All granite has a very trace amount of radioactive minerals in it. Some have more than others. The Redding Pond. I used to live in Redding, Pennsylvania. Yeah. You did? Yeah. I yeah. Too. That's where I started, yeah. I understand. Up by Alvernia. Some wells have, you know, some places have a lot of natural. We had to current. remediate one of our yeah. houses. Would you have yeah. gas coming out of the ground? Just yeah, you just fan the, the gas out, and out in the air for everybody to enjoy, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's released <laughs> out of the rock. The rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So in, in Sharon, you have um, Devil's Rock. Are you are you familiar at all? I'm okay. not. So oh. you have Moose Hill, and then down you've got the lake, and then the creek spills over to Man's Pond, and the creek goes across the street, and then eventually, right, it becomes part of Neponset River? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as it crosses over, there's all these trails, and there are massive boulders there. One has the name Devil's Rock, but there's a bunch of massive and little. Yeah. Is that the rattlesnake? Brown it? It might be, might not be. 
They I might be from so the Dedham granite. Away. They could also be yeah. glacial erratics, which are big boulders that were brought here by the glaciers. Erratics, yeah. They from how far away maybe. Yeah, they broke off. This. So what are they? Say it again. Uh, erratics. They're really just big boulders that got really? caught up with the glacier. And came from somewhere else. Yeah, they, they can come from as far away as New Hampshire or Maine. As opposed to this being the one piece of rattlesnake granite that, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard yeah. that they can trace the direction of flow of the glaciers by looking at those erratics and figuring out where there's a bed of that kind of rock. Up, upstream, so he said, <laughs> and then it deposited downstream, so they can see that it got carried from the original mass of stone. It got broken off and carried downstream a certain distance. Yeah. Sometimes and they can map them, map out the direction of flow. Of the Especially if it's a really distinctive rock. Yeah, right? yeah, something different from what something it's sitting different, on. Something different, yeah. One of the many techniques that we use. Yeah. So the other thing, and this is a great entrance into this. This location has what are known as glacial striations. We're going to have a hard time finding them for two reasons. There is an unbelievable amount of lichen up here covering these rocks. <laughs> and the light is kind of flat today. So they're harder to see when the light is gray. Um, but we can wander around, go up there, look for them. When the ice passes over these, over the land, it's picked up lots of rock and debris from upstream in the glacier and so by the time it gets here it's pretty rough the bottom of the glacier is rough and it's just grinding away at the rock as it flows over it and so these striations are sort of flat grooves in the rock mm -hmm. and they show the direction of travel of the ice and what there are, are some then? here are, um, are the, those aren't the striations no those are fractures uh, uh -huh. yep. or joints the songs can walk up to the summit and look up there. yeah so now we are on the summit of the Rattlesnake Hill and I would like to share more information about the granite itself while you are enjoying the view. So the granite from Moyles Quarry, which is on the other side of Mountain Street in what is now called Borderland State Park, was used to build the railroad viaduct in Canton in 1835. The construction of the viaduct was an important project because it connected Boston and Providence by, by railroad. An old white horse called Charlie helped to pull a flat car loaded with the stone from the Sharon Quarry to the side of the viaduct because it was down the hill. For his efforts, he was given the honor of being the first passenger to cross the bridge. The train station is Sharon is a stop of the MBTA commuter trains to and from Boston to Providence. Amtrak trains to Boston and Washington pass through Sharon but stop at the Route 128. The railroad from Boston to Providence was completed in 1835 and from Boston to New York in 1839. By the way, there used to be three railroad stations in Sharon. One was at Heights and one the current one and then on Norwood Cemetery. The main train station was actually on the other side, um, on the Providence side. So if you see pictures, it doesn't look like the current one. <laughs> so if you go for a hike by yourself, keep an eye for these scuff marks. So they are nor north south scuff marks from the glacier and they are kind of faintly visible. And then we use the same path walking back to um, Mountain Street. Somebody has to do it. Job <laughs> Swift, a patriot and prominent <laughs> citizen, Job Swift served on Sharon's first board of selectmen in 1765. Yay! As one of the committee of safety in 1774 and a delegate to the Provincial Congress in 1774 to 75, he was instrumental in helping draft the Suffolk Resolves which were used to form the Declaration of Independence. Well, on April 18, 1775, as did Paul Revere and William Dawes, he wrote warning of the impending march on Concord and Lexington. Because of this prominence, he was often called upon to attest to important documents. Sharon, Histo Sharon Historical Society is proud to own a deed containing an original signature of Job Swift. Wow. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Great. So, so his, his house on Mountain Street. Yes. So when you drive. So this is the job 
Swift House in 1940s and recently it was built in 1735 and it's one of the oldest houses in Sharon. Um, it is on 291 Mountain Street. You can admire it from distance. It is private property now. And this is the resting place of Job Swift at Rockridge Cemetery. So if anyone did not get a chance to look at the rocks at the summit, I wanted to just stop here for a minute if people want to get up close and personal with the rocks in a different way. Um, or maybe you don't have to get down on the ground to look at it. These rocks are part of the rattlesnake granite. So this is another opportunity we can pause here if you want to explore them a little bit. These are eroding out of the formation, so they're the same material as the summit. They're just coming down the hill in pieces. Um, and then when we get to the bottom, I'll have one more tidbit for you about the lake. You can see where can the you tree tell is me, growing out of the rock yeah. there. Yeah. If you see the cracks, Erika, how long would it take before it splits? Did you see right there? Hundreds uh, or thousands of years. Oh, I thought you said like five. Okay. Sometimes <laughs> it can happen all at once. It's very okay. Yeah. It's very very ice. Ice. The water frozen there at the right time. It would yeah. Yeah. Job on it. But this one has a tenacious little tree growing out of it. Mm. And that might accelerate the cracking yeah. of the soil. Yeah, yeah that's the idea. Yeah. And one other thing. Covered in lichens. Lichens actually help erode rock yeah. because as their little roots grow on the surface, they break off individual mineral grains, which speeds up the erosion. There are some scientists working on lichen clocks, which is to try and correlate an erosional rate from lichen. So, how quickly can lichen wear away the surface of a rock? Mm -hmm. So while they're annoying, because they make it hard to see what we want to see, they're a really important part of the overall ecosystem here. Right. Yeah. Fee card. Just sit in the year and have a hat and say five bucks each. <laughs> you need like spoons. You gotta be playing spoons or something. <laughs> <laughs> Oli, you are walking. Well done. I'm impressed. <laughs> oh, so this is the trail that will take you back to the, it's the Elton Cross Trail. That's off of Mountain Street. Oh. This will take you back. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank you for yeah. letting us know. Sorry. So I was the last one in the group because I had to take pictures of everything. However, I captured this incredible uh, granite stone that was split basically by the tree or there was a little crack and the tree, um, the little seedling started growing in it. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's, um, I'm very impressed how incredible nature can be. So if you go hiking up to Rattlesnake Hill, stop once a while and look around. Like uh, right here, you can see all the uh, granite boulders. Basically, the glacier um, pushed them on the front of itself. And then when it melted, they were left behind. And this was a lovely ending to our hike. Uh, Kathy and uh, Donnie, who live on Rattlesnake Hill, and uh, Donnie is... Uh, amateur geologist. Um, he brought different rocks and minerals for all to share. We really enjoyed seeing the uh, different minerals in the rocks. That was really cool. And he shared them with us. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So. What's the dark? <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, you have to take at least two. Thank you for having this. Thank you, Hannah. A special? No. Yeah. Wait, just every one.
called horn blend, a black that's mixed in mm -hmm. with the uh, crystal. Yeah. Amazing. I, uh, I bought granite uh, for my kitchen console. Uh, rock granite. Free rock samples, oh, wow. folks. Free, free rock samples. Help really yourself. A dollar each. Yeah. They're going to get thrown away if you don't yes, take them. Take a rock. Oh, take a rock. Oh, oh, yeah, they're going to get thrown away if you don't take them. So it's kind of mineral called Hi. Oh, wow. Those are gorgeous. I was just What's admiring your, your giant mineral here. This might be magnetite right here. Somewhere. Do you have a magnet for it? Yeah, it's magnetite. I think you have to get a magnet. And you put a magnet on it? Yeah. yeah. I think it's magnetite. So I say, you might want These all came from your yard. That's my yard. You want them, you can have These are beautiful. Some people grow tomatoes. Do you ever go to the North Shore? So... I just wanted to let you know that uh, Sharon Friends of Conservation and Sharon Historical Society are collaborating lately quite a bit. We are organizing different hikes and we will try to always include information about nature as well as history. Anybody is welcome to join us. You don't have to be a member. However, we would encourage you to become a member of either group the membership is pretty low and there are not many demands on volunteers <laughs> so i would like to thank everybody who joined us um, stout members of stoughton historical society as well as members of lake massapoc advisory committee joined us and i would like to give huge shout out and thank you to erica she was fantastic and we really learned so much about rattlesnake hill so don't hesitate to contact her via email if you have a group of people who will be interested in geology. And also thank you to Paul Lowenstein and Paul Newcomb for additional photos. And this is the end and I would like to thank you for watching Sharon Local History.